Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Connie. Kurt, an alcoholic. Um... Let me read step 11. I sought through prayer and meditation. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. I think it's interesting. Um, So um, thanks for asking me to come and thanks for asking me to just be a part of you guys and share my experience. A lot of my experience came from what I was told and the instructions I was given, the insights that I've had, the revelatory experiences that I've uh, had. And so I'm just going to share that, you know, this is not a right or wrong thing. It's not a correct way to do things. The menu is not the meal. The menu is not the meal. Very important. The menu is pointing to the meal. And the meal for me is the revelatory experience of the spiritual awakening of the 12 steps that happen after we incorporate these principles into our life after a period of time. So this is a way of living for me. You know, there's a friend of ours, and he used to say, at some point in the steps, the number's got to come off. At some point in the steps, the numbers got to come off. So <clears throat> I like to start with one of the things you guys gave me. And one of the things the steps gave me was, uh, I thank God that I'm not suffering from what's not happening anymore. I thank God I'm not suffering from what's not happening anymore. 98% of the stuff I suffered from didn't happen. It was a narrative in my head that I called fear. It really wasn't fear. It was mental anxiety produced on some storyline that was based in the future or the past. And um, I keep thinking of Bill's letter, the emotional sobriety letter, that one part um, let me jump around here a little bit. You guys don't mind, do you? He said, because uh, it ties right into uh, what we read, that prayer, St. Francis prayer. Isn't it funny, that prayer? That prayer, I don't think that prayer is a skillful means to an end. I think that prayer was written after a revelatory experience of grace that touched this guy. And that prayer came out of the insight of that revelatory experience. I don't think it's the other way around. I don't think it's a means to an end. I think it was more descriptive than it was instructive. Lord, make me an instrument of this peace. Like, he had to experience some peace, right? some surrender experience, some revelatory experience. And, you know, this is what you get into later on with 10 and 11. You know, it says, be quick to see where religious people are right. It doesn't say be quick to see that religious people are right. There's a huge difference. When that sense of uh, intuition starts to wake up or discernment, There's a sense of recognizing truth, not because you say it's true, but because it's true and it's revelatory. So it's kind of like it says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact. That assumes we have a conscious contact. So let me just clarify this and i'm doing it for myself more than anybody i'm not talking about a belief system i'm talking about beyond belief 
I'm talking about gnosis. I'm talking about the sixth sense they talk about. I'm talking about um, comprehending a word serenity and knowing peace. I'm talking about the awareness of our fears falling from us. I'm talking about <clears throat> being able to look the world in the eye. I'm talking about all the promises that are very descriptive of what it looks like to be consciously aware that you're in the world of the spirit. That's what I'm talking about. And that was all trumped by my thinking. It was veiled by the thinking that was going on, the narrative in the head, the storylines, the guilt, the remorse, the self-pity, all the manifestations of self that I thought were me. And I thought they were me. So <clears throat> there's another part in the book that says our actor is self-centered. The good news is you're not the actor. The actor is his condition that's driving me. We call it the bondage of self here. And it manifests in various ways. That's what the book says. And um, so why am I talking about this in 11? So it really starts in 10. It says, continue to watch. It doesn't say continue to listen. I listened for 20 years. You know, on, in the, in the uh, flyer, it says 10, 10, 10. That was my sobriety day. That was, no, 10, 10, 10 is when I came back in. I went out at 20 years. I drank at 20 years. And basically, I mean, you know, we could, we all do the same thing. You know, we just, you know, we rest on our laurels and, you know, it just took me down. And, but there was something that wasn't seen in that 20 or 25 years since 1979 when I first came in. And it was right in the book and I missed it. And it's this statement, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what defeated us. I missed it, totally missed it. Self is singular, and us is plural. So we got one condition manifesting a bunch of different ways, and it defeats us, and we listen to it as us. You know, I listened to people at the podium, and I thought I was identifying with the people at the podium because I was laughing and I could relate. But really what I was identifying with was a condition that was driving the person at the podium that's very different so what is this routine you know they say we have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance i missed that i had too many years not enough days i missed that um, so if this is a way of living what does it look like well i can just tell you what i did this morning that's all i can tell you because None of it matters except for that, right? So I got up and I went down to the beach. I go down to the beach every day. Um, I sit on the wall and I just kind of uh, do my deal with the little tobacco offering. That was the way I was brought up. You don't have to do that. Please don't adopt something you, you don't want to adopt. <clears throat> and the reason I do a tobacco offering is this. It's, it says um, I was told by a couple guys that are influential in my life, Don Coes and Bill Bird. He said, when you ask for something, when you pray for something, you have to give something. He said, if you don't, you create an imbalance. He said, you want to keep balance. So before you pray, I want you to do a tobacco offering. So you offer tobacco and then you ask for something. So you keep harmony. So what am I asking for? It says direct my thinking. Before we begin, we direct our thinking, right? Why, why would I have my thinking directed? I mean, you guys know all this. Because the main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind, that's what it says in the book. The main problem the alcoholic centers in his mind, it doesn't center in his spirit, it centers in his mind. And uh, I'm asking God to direct my thinking. 
divorce it from self-pity, dishonest, self-seeking motives. So this is just my understanding of this. And, you know, I sat with this and, you know, me and Coy has talked about this, like, you know, you do, you do the words. Yeah, you get the words down and you just repeat it, you know, and it becomes moat, you know. And then you start asking yourself, well, what does this mean to me, you know? <laughs> I mean, so selfish, it says, direct my thinking, divorce it from self-pity. To me, self-pity is the past. It's a manifestation of self. Dishonest is, in the moment, I don't see with any clarity or lucidity. I'm seeing through an ego lens or the lens of self. I'm seeing through an interpretation of life. I'm not seeing life. And self-seeking is a future for me. So what I'm asking for is for my thought life to be on a higher plane. And what that means is if I'm divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking mo motives, I'm present. My thought life's on a higher plane. I'm here. And that's how I start my day. So um, then I come into the office. Uh, I talked to somebody in Colorado before I got here about um, how do we navigate this this shore that we've stepped on? How do we navigate this? Like if we step and bridge the shore, how do we navigate this? You know, it says it in our book a bunch of different ways. We cease fighting anything or anyone. even alcohol, secondary, right? So this whole process was about, um, you know, coming to terms with life on life's terms, you know, like how life's going to throw curveballs because it always does, right? <clears throat> it's not my, it's not what happens to me, it's my reaction to what happens to me. That's what I found out. So let me give you my perspective on the fourth step from the 10th step or 11th step. So from an 11th or 10th step perspective on the fourth step, first two columns are never true, ever. That's a 10th and 11th step perspective. A fourth step perspective on the fourth step is I keep going back to one and two. So I think it's a little different. You know, we read the thing, you know, you can't really separate 10 and 11, but it says, saw through prayer and meditation, right? And the other one says, continue to take personal inventory. Well, if you just read the statement, it sounds like, it sounds like they're telling me to write an inventory. That's what it sounds like. I mean, that's what I heard first time I heard it. But if you read the instructions, that's not what it says. The instructions are a way of living and a way of being consciously aware of how you're moving through the world with your conduct in relationship to other people and other things. So there's some conscious awareness of how I'm moving through the world. I'm not walking through the world asleep now or not most of the time, let's just put it that way, most of the time I'm not. And what, what entails that for me is a lot of pausing in the beginning. Pause was a huge thing. I told Koyas that was the biggest thing he ever gave me. I said, when you told, and I thought it was stupid, you know, like, he's like, pause. I'm like, oh, man, that's stupid, you know, like, of course you do it for about three or four weeks and then you realize, oh, well, that wasn't so stupid, you know. So, what does that have to do with? It has to do with in, when agitated or doubtful, he told me, you can, this is real simple. You can look for agitation and doubt. That's all you got to look for. I'm like, ah, no big deal, you know, uh, until I really put some effort into doing it. And I called him a week later. I said, I failed the test. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I said, the test you gave me, you know, that test, you know, I failed it. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, you said pause when agitated or doubtful. I said, I didn't get anything done all week. I was pausing all week. 
And he said, you dummy, that wasn't a test. That was to bring your conscious awareness to the fact how much you're not here. And when you're in a, we call it a fear-based state, third column gets triggered. It gets, there's a reactive state that gets triggered, hurt, threatened, or interfered with. And that reactive state produces a fourth column. And what pausing does is it interrupts the narrative or the energy that's flowing, reactive energy, and the pause interrupts that. And it allows space for an intuitive thought or a decision. So it was like, see, these, I was like, oh, these are, you know, like you got to practice these principles, you know, like this wasn't just something I, I read a lot about this in the first 25 years of sobriety, but I, I didn't practice it. I, I knew a lot about it. I could tell you a lot about it. Gee, I mean, me and Marty were really good at that. We could tell you all kinds of things. But, but there was no practical application, right? No practical application. So, um, you know, the other thing I touched on, in fact, I just watched a thing about a guy that was really inspirational in the spiritual movement in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, who was really big in that movement, who died of alcoholism, drank himself to death. Here he was a spiritual guy and drank himself to death, fifth of gin every day. And it's like... That's how we, I don't know, I came in that way. I came in, I didn't know what I was looking for. I just knew uh, I suffered from this thing before I drank. And the thing I suffered from was this bondage of self. And I didn't even know it. I mean, I really didn't because I was identified as it. And I tried to kill myself three times. I drove off a freeway one time. I tried to overdose another time. And then I laid in a bathtub and slit my wrist open with a scalpel. And you know what was funny about this? When I finally woke up, I realized I was trying to kill the wrong self the whole time and didn't know it. The whole time I was trying to kill the wrong self and didn't know it. I wasn't trying to kill me. I didn't know me. So this whole process of, you know, the steps and, you know, how we go through them. And I, I say this is very stage specific. I mean, there's a lot of guys in here that got a lot of time sobriety. You know, Bill and Bob didn't know shit about 30 years sobriety. They didn't have 30 years sobriety. They did not travel that road, you know, like there was a lot of new territory that these guys were, I mean, look at the, Look at this, look at the movement and how it, I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. It is friggin' amazing. One drunk helping another. I mean, part of, part of what I found, and this was years ago, was when it said, be quick to see where religious people are right. I was like, so what did that mean to me? You know, I mean, we read all kind of different stuff in, in program. We try to keep it, you know, to our A literature. But then when I read stuff from, let's just say, some of the guys that I've listened to, um, Rami Shapiro, Rupert Spire, Francis Lucille, Richard Rohr, um, Jim Finley. I mean, there's, you know, we all have our, our little teachers that speak to us, Peter Russell. Um, and we have our people in AA. But what I realized was when I started looking into these perennial philosophies and these deep mystical traditions and wisdom traditions, I realized AA was much bigger than I thought it was. And the teachings in AA were much bigger than I thought they were. And I would read stuff and I'd go, oh, it says that in the big book. Oh, it says that in the big book. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, it says that in the big book, you know. It was like this discovery thing, you know. And I thought, oh, this is why. 
you know, this is why they say, you know, you need to really pay attention here. This is a way of living, you know. It doesn't have to do with religion. It has to do with, you know, I think it has to do with our moral conduct and how we carry ourselves, you know. That's what I, that's just my experience. Being accountable, you know, talking to people. We have people, you know, the fellowship. And this is, you know, crazy. Most people aren't even asking the questions we're asking. I mean, and I didn't ask him because it was a good idea. I asked him because I was baffled by the seeming futility of existence. Once confused it means I'm not anymore. Once confused. Like I'm not confused to how my life turned into a train wreck. Not because I did it because I was driven by something that had taken me over. I mean, that's really easy to see as far as alcohol, right? I mean, we talk about it all the time, the obsession of the mind, the insanity that precedes the first drink, a sober condition. Why is it any different with the condition of self? It's not. I needed to be released from drinking. I could not quit. Let me say that again. I needed to be released from drinking. I could not quit. The same is true with self. I needed to be released. I could not play whack-a-mole with it and manage it anymore in sobriety. All it produced was more fear, more anxiousness, and I was sober a long time. Something was missing. What was it? For me, it was the integration of this way of living. It wasn't that I didn't go to enough meetings. It wasn't that I didn't sponsor enough people. I sponsored hundreds of people. It wasn't that I wasn't a GSR. It wasn't that I, you know, you know, it wasn't any of that. It was the depth of this thing had not come into full maturation and wholeness and being body slammed and getting surrendered at 20 years sober did it, and thank God it did it. I wouldn't trade that for nothing. Because what it really told me was what the book said, and I just missed it. What you really have is a daily reprieve, contingent on the maintenance of the spiritual condition. Now, I veer off a little bit here. Some of you guys know that. I don't think the spiritual condition needs to be maintained. I think the mental condition that tells me I'm spiritually sick needs to be maintained. That's what needs to be maintained. That's what needs to be kept in check. Inner critic, the commentary, that voice that's not me is talking to you the same way. It's recognizing that the condition that's driving me and me are two totally different things because we're way, 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 way bigger than that condition. And if it's a condition driving me, I can be free from it. If it's a condition I am, I cannot be free from it. So that's kind of where this 10, 11, 12 stuff kind of this goes back to that thing, thank God I'm not suffering from what's not happening anymore. I mean, that just friggin' amazes me. It just amazes me. I'm in awe of this every day. And um, people that know me know that. Um, and I think that's our responsibility is recovered members of Alcoholics Anonymous is to carry the message. Not that you got to stay in bondage the whole time, but that we have a way out. I mean, we talk about it all the time. We read the promises. I mean, aren't the promises beautiful descriptions of what it looks like to be present? I mean, bingo, like, so, 
Um, let me go back in the book here real quick. Every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. Here's, here's, here's how I say it. I don't say thy will be done. It sounds like a future event. I say thy will is being done. It's happening right now. Thy will is being done. It's happening. None to do. What does uh, DeMello say? DeMello says, everything's a mess. All is well, but everything's a mess. <laughs> like that. All is well, but everything's a mess. <laughs> my saying is, I like to tell my guys, look, get some popcorn, sit down and watch the show. Just get some popcorn, sit down and watch. That position of neutrality when accessible, can produce a state of peace and well-being that the mind has no understanding of. And I think that's what we carry, you know, I think that's what we carry. That's the hope. Language is kind of limited. You know, our actions, most of us, I'll speak for myself, my actions, and people's actions on me had huge effects, huge effects. I mean, uh, more so than words a lot of times, you know. I remember when I was drinking, I had a friend that called me and they said, hey, we're gonna send you to a retreat. I said, you can't do that, I'm drinking right now. And they said, well, we're gonna send you anyways. And they came and picked me up. They put me on an airplane and they sent me to Angel Fire. Or maybe Joel was there. Uh, Angel Fire with Coyus back, um, I don't know how many years ago it was, 15 maybe. Anyways, uh, we got there, and of course, you know, I'm hungover. I can't get a bottle, and I made mean, a retreat with a bunch of sober people that are pissing me off. And <clears throat> I got a hangover, and Coyus, uh, when we brought the hoop in, which is a hoop with 100 eagle feathers on it, um, he was brought it in to the beginning of the meeting. And he had four different people, because there's four colors in the medicine wheel, he had four different people, black, white, Asian, red, right, uh, carry the hoop in. Guess who the white guy was? Moi, drunk, feeling terrible, shouldn't be touching the hoop, all the narrative in the head, you screwed up, you blew it, you shouldn't even be here. You know, you know we all hear it. And I carried that hoop in, and I cried like a baby, you know. And there's something that touched me, you know. I don't know what it was, but it touched me. Yeah, it wasn't long after that I got sober. Who knows? Who knows? You know, what happened was I said a prayer somebody told me to say. And uh, the prayer was this. So, you know, I was drinking at 20 years. You know, my wife wasn't too happy with me. She's sober 38, 39 years now, my ex-wife. And she divorced me. She, she gave me divorce papers. Well, I took them, you know, I, I received them graciously in the kitchen, lit them on fire, dropped them on the floor. You know? um, and then... Uh, <clears throat> The prayer I used was a guy that told me to, he followed me out to my plumbing truck. I was drinking, I was up at a men's stag. Somebody told me to go to men's stag. I don't do men's stag, you know, that's not my thing. And uh, so I went anyways, cause you know, we're supposed to do what we're told. <clears throat> and this guy came following me out cause I was, I was really ragging on my wife for leaving me and how she screwed everything up and da -da, you know, it's all her fault, right? And uh, he followed me out to my plumbing truck. He said, hey, I noticed you raised your hand as a newcomer. I said, well, yeah, I'm drinking this morning. He said, well, you're not a newcomer. 
He said, you've been around here 20 years. He said, you're not a newcomer. He said, we didn't design that for this. Everybody knows you up here. He said, that wasn't designed for this. He said, every time you raise your hand as a newcomer, you put more guilt and remorse on the condition you're trying to extinguish. Stop it. And I heard that resonance of truth I hadn't heard in a long time. And then he walked off, left me stand in a parking lot. Two weeks later, same meeting, same bitching I was doing about my wife. Follow me back out to the plumbing truck again. He said, can I make a suggestion, another suggestion? I said, sure. And he said, uh, can I write a prayer for you to say? And if you say it, I guarantee it'll work. And I said, sure. Well, I just wanted to go home and drink. I just wanted him to shut up and leave me alone. So uh, he, he wrote a prayer down. The prayer is behind me sitting on that little altar. It says, uh, God, please give Rhonda the very best of life has to offer. Please give her health, happiness, and prosperity. And please give her a peace and understanding she's never experienced before. He said, that's the prayer I want you to say for her. So in my head, I'm thinking, I'm going to say the prayer, and she's going to change. That's what I thought. Doesn't work that way, does it, Joe? So I said the prayer. Three months later, the prayer happened to me. And how that prayer happened to me was it released me from the obsession to drink. It parted the veil that I was looking through my whole life. The lens of self, it parted it. And I thought, holy moly, this is, <laughs> this is when you start touching the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so that was like, you know, Whenever 1010, 10, we say 1010, 10, really I was in detox 106, but you know, yeah, somewhere around there. So, am I burning energy foolishly? Not so much. Am I trying to arrange life to suit myself? Not so much. I'm not saying I don't do it. I'm just saying not so much. I have a, we say it here, I, can, I always hated it, but I, it's like I have this attitude of gratitude, right? I have this sense of sacredness about life that I never had before. I always had, even in AA, many years sober, plan B. You know what it was? If it gets bad enough, I'll take myself out. That was my escape, and I could not get rid of it. I worked the steps on it, and what got rid of it was the revelatory experience that released me. And it released me from that existential crisis of unworthiness that I'd always suffered from, that irritable, restless, discontent condition that I didn't even know I was suffering from. I thought this is the way it is. That's really, really amazing. So I think my time's about up. Is that about right, Connie? Getting close, huh? So um, thanks, you guys. You know, the other thing, can, can I have another two minutes? Five. Let me tell you, th this, this had a, a huge in, uh, effect on me. And this was Coyus when he told me a story about Johnny Looking Cloud. And, I'll, you know, I'm butchering the way he tells it, but, but I'm going to tell it the way I heard it and the way it affected me. He went up to see Johnny Looking Cloud when he had like four or five years sober and he was struggling. He was in the winter season of his sobriety and <clears throat> uh, he was, you know, you know, we talk to new guys and they just talk and you kind of wait for them to shut up about 30 minutes later, you know, like, you know, we all did it, right? I mean, you say, how are you doing? And you get a life story, you know, for like... <laughs> But uh, he, he went up to Johnny Looking Cloud, and John, Johnny Looking Cloud was like, um, he had three sponsors, you know, he said, uh, I had Don Pritz, I had uh, Big Frank, and I had Johnny Looking Cloud, right? 
And Johnny looked at Cloud. He said after he was up there sitting with him a while, he said, finally, Don shut up. And Donnie looked at Cloud, took him outside. He said, come outside. He said, I want you to do something. He took him outside and he took his cane and he drew a long 20 foot line in the sand. And he said, now get over here. And I said, he goes, I want you to walk on that line. And Don's like, okay, he gets on the line. He starts walking and Johnny looking cloud comes up and he pushes him off the line. And Corey goes, what'd you do that for? He said, "Never mind. get back on the line. He gets back on the line, starts walking and pushes him the other way off the line. So he's done this about five or six times and Corey is getting kind of pissed off. And uh, Johnny looking cloud said, turn around, look. He said, you see that line? You see those footprints off that line? He said, you think the path is that line? It's not. The path is those footprints off the path and on the path, off the path and on the path, off the path and on the path. And it clicked. For me, it clicked. It wasn't right or wrong. And it clicked in the sense of corrective measures, mistakes. See, these are, I didn't fuck up, excuse my language. I, I want to use that for a specific term, though. See, that's a term of guilt, shame, remorse, self-pity. I made a mistake. Oh, no narrative, no storyline attached. And there's a corrective measure. Off track, on track, off track, on track. And I was like, Oh, this is what they're talking about. This isn't shame and guilt. This is how we grow. And if you get into different wisdom traditions, you'll see a lot of guys say spiral dynamics. Ken Wilber, you go Richard Rohr, two steps forward, five steps back. Native tradition, you go into the seasons, winter, summer, spring, fall, right? So all these modalities are talking about the same thing. They're pointing to something. They're pointing to something. And you're the carrier. The great reality is deep down within every one of us. And uh, that's a blessing. Thanks, Connie. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.